and welcome. There's a hidden world of amazing creatures that own the night, many of which some people have rarely seen or heard. My name's Beverly Hill, and I'd like to take you on an amazing adventure into the nocturnal world of one of these fascinating creatures, the Southern Flying Squirrel. When you hear the term flying squirrel, you may be thinking about flying squirrels like Olympic champion Gabby Douglas or even Rocky from the cartoon Rocky and Bullwinkle. But real flying squirrels are even more fascinating than their famous counterparts. The southern flying squirrel is a small nocturnal squirrel that resides in the southeastern United States, sometimes overlapping the range of its larger cousin, the northern flying squirrel in some northeastern areas. Because these squirrels are nocturnal, many people may never encounter one, but that doesn't stop them from carrying out their secret lives. On average, the southern flying squirrel can reach 8 to 10 inches in length. Its most notable features are its large round eyes, petegium, a membrane of skin connecting the fore and hind limbs, and a wide feather-shaped tail which it uses as a steering rudder. Although called flyers, they can more accurately be referred to as gliders, capable of gliding distances of up to 100 yards or 295 feet. The southern flying squirrel will climb to the top of a tall tree and launch itself across the forest. As soon as it lands on the target tree, it will immediately run to the back of the tree to evade any predators, such as an owl, that may have been tracking its flight path. The flying squirrel has another secret power, communication. I first met Dr. L. Michelle Gilley at a conference in 2010 where she was giving a presentation entitled Spoken Like a True Southern Flyer, Decoding the Language of the Southern Flying Squirrel. While working on her doctorate at Auburn University, Dr. Gilley, currently an assistant professor of biology with Mars Hill University, discovered that both northern and southern flying squirrels have their own language. Dr. Gilly's work with flyers began with a baby flyer named Petey. She noticed that when she would hold him, he would vibrate, stop, vibrate, and stop, much like the bats she worked with. Her experience with bats taught her that when they vibrated, they were actually broadcasting ultrasonically. Dr. Gilly was able to build a call library and categorize eight different types of calls emitted by the southern flying squirrel. These range from short and long whistles, chirps, barks, crows, upsweeps, short and long trills, and most important of all, the call of the juvenile flying squirrel. Below the age of eight weeks, juvenile flyers are completely dependent on their mothers for food, warmth, and protection. If the juvenile flyer becomes distressed while the mother is off hunting, it utilizes an ultrasonic call that's audible for over a mile to summon mom back to the nest. Juveniles lose this ability once they reach eight weeks of age. Researchers hypothesize that these calls are used for a variety of different forms of communication, including territorial, reproduction, socialization, and alarm. Because flyers are social animals and are capable of traveling over long distances, this adaptation of being able to vocalize calls in both the sonic and ultrasonic range may have developed to allow them to communicate things like food sources, danger, and location. The habitat of the southern flying squirrel is one of diversity. They inhabit hardwood, mixed hardwood, and scrub forests, as well as urban green spaces where their natural range has been encroached upon by man. They prefer multiple nest sites, in natural tree cavities with small openings of one and a half inches to three and three quarters inches, or small nests of twigs built in the boughs of trees, though they have also been found in woodpecker nests, bluebird boxes, and in attics. The USDA Forestry Service has noted flying squirrels displacing endangered red cockaded woodpeckers from their nests, including artificial nests meant to encourage their recovery. Further research indicates that woodpecker nests placed closer than a half mile to a water source, such as a creek or river, 
has a higher occurrence of flying squirrels. During the winter months, the flying squirrel does not hibernate. Instead, it prefers nests that it shares with multiple individuals in order to conserve heat during the coldest of temperatures. As many as 50 squirrels have been found sharing a communal nest. The flying squirrel is omnivorous, having a highly varied diet, eating seeds, nuts, insects, plants, mushrooms, fruits, berries, eggs, young birds, and carrion. You can sometimes identify if you have a flyer visiting your bird feeder because unlike gray squirrels, the flying squirrel choose perfectly round holes in nuts. During nesting season, which can occur two to three times per year, the female flying squirrel prefers tree cavities to raise her young, where she will usually give birth to between two and four offspring. Naked and defenseless, and weighing just a couple of grams each, these tiny babies must rely entirely upon their mother. This can be a difficult time for the mother squirrel to venture away from the nest. Owls, raccoons, snakes, foxes, bobcats, and even feral cats all prey on small mammals such as the flying squirrel. In fact, as most rehabbers can attest, the leading injury of flying squirrels brought into rescue facilities are injuries caused by cats. Given the large number of predators that the flying squirrel must contend with, their lifespan in the wild is only about five years. Those in captivity can live for more than 15 years provided they are given the proper diet and care. Flying squirrels are generally hardy and have very few health issues. In some states, flyers are allowed to be kept legally as pets. Juvenile flying squirrels are known to bond very closely with their caregivers and can make wonderful pets. However, owning a flying squirrel takes a huge commitment, knowledge of proper nutrition, and all of the love that you can give. Also found in the pet trade is another similar animal, our marsupial called the sugar glider. These two animals are often misidentified as the other, but should not be confused or housed together. A study conducted by the CDC has revealed a small handful of cases where humans interacting with nesting materials and associated louse feces within the nests of wild flying squirrels have contracted epidemic typhus, a rare and sometimes life-threatening disease. The CDC also states that it is extremely rare for a flying squirrel to contract and transmit rabies. I hope that you've enjoyed this adventure into the world of the southern flying squirrel. I couldn't have done it without the help of a large number of people that I've met over the years, including Wallace Mayo with the Florida Trail Association, who placed a baby flying squirrel into my hands during a camping trip seven years ago. Yep, that's baby Benji snuggled up to a sock. A word of caution, never look a baby flyer directly in the eyes because they will steal your heart. I also have to thank the fine folks at thesquirrelboard.com for sharing their experience and knowledge about squirrels of all types and ages. Special thanks to Dr. Michelle Gilley for lending me some of her material to help put this video together. Thank you.